senior fellow kind of at the moment in name only here at the New America Foundation, although I was here for a number of years and I'm, I'm also the uh, executive editor of the American Prospect magazine. And uh, I was uh, uh, called in for emergency duty to help moderate this event uh, this morning and I was totally thrilled about it. I can't tell you uh, how excited I was to be able to uh, introduce Mike Lux and moderate uh, this discussion about, about Mike's book, The Progressive Revolution. Um, I've known Mike Lux for, for many, many years and, uh, and, uh, and, and think the world of him and was, was thrilled when I heard a few years ago, a few months ago actually that, that he was writing a book. I, just, I thought that was a terrific idea. And you know, Mike is, uh, when you think about it, Mike, Mike to me is one of those people who's kind of a connector between a lot of different worlds, which I think is a, is a, is a vitally important uh, role that, that only, a, only a few people play. It's kind of, you know, kind of a social entrepreneur in many ways, uh, as well as an intellectual. And, and uh, I've seen Mike as a connector between kind of the worlds of activism and the worlds of, uh, of organized philanthropy. We were on a, we were on a board together at, uh, uh, for a while of a, of a philanthropic uh, operation. He's the co-founder of Progressive Strategies, which, which serves as a consulting firm for, for a lot of different uh, 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 kind of progressive organizations and, uh, and, 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 and donors. Uh, and, uh, and most recently, he was a, he was a, a key member of the, uh, of the Obama-Biden transition team. Uh, which is vital. Last year, he he helped launch OpenLeft.com, which quickly became a really critical part of the uh, of the Netroots uh, infrastructure, along with such you know such figures as Matt Stoller and uh, and Chris Bowers. Uh, he's one of those people. He's one of those people who kind of throws off organizations in his wake, including Americans United for Change, the Center for Progressive Leadership, um, Progressive Majority, the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center, and Women's Voices, Women Vote. Uh, in the late 90s, he worked at People for the American Way and was a constituency director in the Clinton-Gore campaign and transition team, and, and worked for President Clinton in the in the White House. Uh, one of the one of those people who kind of brought the roots, brought the grassroots. Uh, uh, presence into the in, into the White House from his uh, from his base and experience in uh, in 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 the Midwest and 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 so forth. So he's continued to kind of link these two roles. When I look at this book, and you know, the thing about it is, I you know, I, so the book the book got completed so quickly, and it's great when you know when an activist sits down, they do their work, they get their book written, and it just it really does seem like just yesterday that that I kind of heard that Mike's starting to work on a, on a book. And, and it's really, to me, it's uh, what's, what's interesting about it. Lot, conservatives will often say to, to liberals, you know, you, have, you don't really have any ideas. We have our, you know, we have our books. We have Hayek. We have these things we read. You liberals don't really have those things. And, um, and of course, progressives do. Um, but what's, what's often, what you don't find a lot in the, in the world, in the progressive world, I think, is people who uh, bridge activism and the and the intellectual world. You have a lot of people who are you know sitting up there thinking about interesting thoughts, whether it's you know good policy ideas or or more abstract, more the abstractions of history and and political theory. And then you have people who are kind of doing the work, and the people doing the work often don't have much of a broad perspective about where they came from and why they're here. Uh, and uh, there are a few people who cross over from one side, uh, and I think Mike's one of the one of the very few people who crosses over most strongly from the world of activism to pull back, pull the lens back, and really think about the historical and theoretical uh, roots of why we why we do what we do, why we believe what we believe, and and how we make this country a better place. So that's what this he'll tell you more about how this book answers that challenge, and uh, and then we'll have have some time for for questions. Great, thank you. Matt. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Mark and I have been in, uh, in quite a few uh, battles, mostly on the same side. <laughs> occasionally, occasionally on different sides, but we, we've been uh, working to build uh, the progressive movement together for a long time. And I, I appreciate his stepping in at the last minute for Steve, who I, who I talked to briefly in his incredibly hoarse, uh, silenced voice uh, uh, today. And sorry, he's not feeling well. Um, Mark, Mark alluded to this. But I just wanted to sort of make a comment. I, I had I had a friend sort of say say something funny to me when when the book came out, and he said, he said I, I didn't know that you were an academic wannabe, uh, and um, uh, in in fact I'm not. I I uh, have never been much of an academic, never been that interested uh, in it. Uh, in fact, I quit college uh, early uh, and became a Vista worker and 
went from one organizing job to another organizing job to another to another and never looked back, never went back to college. And so I've been a practitioner my whole life uh, of, of politics and of political battles and engaged in the debates uh, of, uh, of our time. Uh, but uh, I, I am an avid history reader, and I, I kept finding that I would work during the day on, on uh, you know, whether it was writing speeches uh, uh, at the White House or on political campaigns or uh, w working, you know, uh, working on talking points uh, for, for a given thing or working with organizations on, on the battles that they were doing. And, and I'd go home at night and I'd, I'd read uh, whatever, whatever my current history book that I had picked up was, and I found that the debates overwhelmingly were being recycled, that the, the same kinds of arguments that we are making today about equal rights were being made in 1776. The same kind of debates that we are making about uh, democracy, the nature of democracy and voting rights and who should vote and, and how much the people should rule versus the elites. Same arguments being made uh, all, all the way through American history. The same arguments about uh, economic policy, uh, whether, whether to invest in the middle class uh, and, and creating jobs for, for the middle class, the working class, and the, and the poor, or whether to just uh, give more money and power and tax breaks to the wealthy and let them do everything and, and, and let it trickle down uh, to everybody else. Um, those kinds of debates uh, have, have fueled uh, all of American history uh, from, from the first days uh, of the country, from before even the, the Declaration of Independence. And it's been fascinating uh, to watch that. As I started to put together the book, the other thing that I realized, uh, and, and it's so important for the moment that we're in today, is that uh, when, when change has come in America, when, when, the, when the big reforms that have happened that have made America a, a better place to be, uh, they've tended to, to come all at once uh, over a few years. There have tended to be what I came to call, uh, in the course of writing the book, big change moments. Um, that there were, there were a few periods of history where the problems had become so big and the movements of, for change had become so vital and the po political leaders started to respond to that uh, and started to realize that big change was needed where it, it came all of a sudden in a rush. And you saw that uh, you know, of course, around the time of the American Revolution, uh, where the, the change then was so radical. I mean, this idea of having a country without a king was completely unheard of uh, at, at the time and, and un, unprecedented uh, in, in uh, that era. Uh, in fact, at the Constitutional Convention, Alexander Hamilton argued essentially that we should have a king, that we should, we should not elect but appoint someone uh, in this new president's role to serve for life uh, and never, that ha never have them have an election again. Uh, we, so there, that argument was going on uh, even as the country was being founded, and th this radical idea. Um, and I talk in the book about how uh, there was a debate around the revolution. Uh, there was also a debate around the, the Constitutional Convention about the nature of democracy and that progressive thinkers uh, and I include Tom Paine, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin in that list, uh, fought for some good things that, that eventually happened, uh, but also lost some, some of those key battles, and the country has, has been hurt by that uh, as a result. Uh, so that was the first big change moment. The other ones that I, uh, that I uh, document are, uh, there, the second big one was in the 1860s, uh, where Again, the problems were so huge. Uh, Lincoln and the radical Republicans, uh, r right now when we say radical Republicans, we mean something different, but back then the Republican Party was the party of reform and the Democratic Party was the party of the Southern conservatives. And uh, the times have changed a little bit, but that was, that was back then. But in the 1860s, this rush of things happened. Everybody th thinks of the 1860s as being, okay, Civil War, slaves were freed, that was what happened. Uh, in fact, uh, it was an incredible period of economic exper experimentation and constitutional experimentation. Uh, there were three major constitutional amendments that were passed that dramatically reshaped 
uh, the American Constitution and, and how the law uh, was supposed to be done. And those constitutional amendments actually, and, and a lot of folks don't know this, but when the Bill of Rights was written, uh, conservatives argued that it only applied to what the federal government could do. It had no application in the states. That state governments could go in and do whatever they wanted to in terms of repressing the freedom of speech, repressing the freedom of religion. It was up to the states what they wanted to do in their states. Uh, the 1860s completely changed that notion and created this idea of universal citizenship, uh, universal voting rights, universal application of the Bill of Rights to all American citizens. It was a fundamental rethinking uh, of America. The 1860s also was a time when uh, Lincoln and the Republicans were giving away millions of acres of free land uh, to, uh, to poor people through the Homestead Act. It was a time when they created the land-grant university system that allowed poor people and working class people to go to college for the first time. It was a time when they were the, they were the first ones to actually pass a progressive income tax. Uh, first time that that had happened in American history. Uh, so the changes that were going on in that era uh, were, were immense, and uh, the, the era would have been a big change moment even if the Civil War had never happened. But when you add, add the Civil War to that, it was remarkable. The next big change moment came in the early 1900s when uh, suffragists and the populist movement, the progressive movement, all kind of came together and created this, this sea change moment uh, where the, the big trusts were broken up, where the national park system were, was created, uh, the, the income tax uh, was, was finally uh, put in uh, permanently, uh, the IRS uh, was created, and some people don't like that, but it allowed for there to be a system of progressive taxation. Uh, senators were elected by the people rather than by, uh, by state legislatures. Uh, and most importantly, women uh, got the right to vote uh, in that era. And all of those things happened, uh, again, in a, in a very short period of time, this huge wave of change. Next big change, of course, was the New Deal. And I, I find it really funny uh, that uh, conservatives are now arguing that, that FDR actually made the Depression worse. I mean, it's such, a, it's such an absurd notion. I wrote a blog post the other day entitled uh, Conservatives. Uh, colon, uh, FDR sucked, Bush was great, so let's just keep doing what we're doing. Uh, I mean, that, that's, their, that's their argument, that FDR uh, it was a bad president and that his policies didn't work, he, that he was, he was an awful guy and he made the Depression worse. Uh, but, but the country was so frozen at that moment. I mean, it literally was on the verge of a panic. Uh, and people were saying to FDR, you should, you should just impose martial law. Uh, you, you should do what these, these guys over in Europe, like Mussolini and Hitler, are doing and just impose martial law, because that's the only thing that will save us. And FDR rejected that advice uh, and began his, his program of broad progressive economics uh, that allowed the banks to become unfrozen, that created a new regulatory framework, that allowed wages to start rising again, that unemployment started dropping steadily year after year through, through the New Deal. Uh, you know, Social Security got uh, put into place. Unions were allowed to organize legally for, for really and, and opened up for the, for the first time. Uh, so it was this huge movement uh, that, that, again, happened all at once in just a few short years. Uh, the next time, of course, was the 60s, and uh, some, of us, some of us were around uh, to, to remember that. I, I, I was a kid, but you could see it all, all around you, you know, even, even as a kid. The, the changes that were going on. And I, I talk in the book about how the, the 1950s really was sort of the beginning of, of the modern era because both conservatives and progressives were organizing those days. But in, in the early 60s, there was a period of about 18 months where uh, the, uh, the March on Washington and the I Have a Dream speech happened, where Tom Hayden and, and his uh, colleagues at the University of Michigan wrote uh, the, the, the manifesto that started the student movement, where Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, where Betty Friedan published The Feminine Mystique, where Cesar Chavez uh, really launched his major new organizing drive in California. All of these happened uh, within an 18-month period, this moment in time where, where progressivism just exploded. 
And that, that momentum lasted uh, for about a decade afterwards, and, and all these major things uh, were, were passed into law. Uh, and, and again, people sort of focus on, a, on one or two things, but it wasn't just the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act. It, it was Medicare, it was Medicaid, it was Head Start, uh, it was legal services, it was community action agencies, uh, it was environmental legislation that was passed for the first time, it was women's rights legislation that was passed for the first time. This whole series of things that happened. So ever since then, we've been kind of stuck uh, in this period of, of reaction and retrenchment uh, where conservatives have really dominated uh, the political debate, uh, have scared people. Uh, uh, I mean, the, and I talk about the whole fear versus hope dynamic that's been throughout history. Uh, and, uh, but what I argue is that now is the time for another big change moment. The, the problems that we have are too big to solve with small, cautious steps. Uh, I think the movement, the progressive movement, which, which really got kind of isolated from, from itself and fragmented into single issue groups in, in the 80s and 90s, I think is come back and is more united and is more passionate than it's been in a long time. And we, and we have a president and a Congress who uh, I believe and hope uh, are open to big change and want to do big change. There, there are huge hurdles that we're going to have to fight through th to get it. And I talk in the book how none of these eras, that was it, there was anything automatic about this. There's nothing immutable about there. Now is the time for big change, so it'll just happen. Uh, we had a moment where we could have had it in the early 90s, and we blew it. And I say we because I was in the Clinton administration. We, but we, we were trying to make big change happen, and we failed. Um, so there's nothing uh, inevitable about this. Um, but I believe if we keep pushing, and I think progressive movement uh, has to keep pushing on, uh, on President Obama and the Congress, that if we do that and if they are bold enough to respond, we've got a chance for another huge wave of change with health care, with, with energy policy, with foreign policy, uh, with education policy. I think there are so many different things that we can do uh, to rebuild the middle class, get wages rising again, and create a new regulatory framework so that we're not a, a bubble economy, but that we're an economy that really has a strong and growing middle class again. So I'm going to stop there and be, be glad to answer any questions. Mark, uh, uh, you, you take it away in terms right. of the moderating thing. I'll be in charge of who gets to ask questions. Thank you, Wayne. Let's uh, <laughs> Thank you. You don't have to wait until he gets hit with all the questions to, uh, to, uh, to applaud. Um, I was tempted to ask the question of when we were on different sides, but that's a, I guess that we'll, do, <laughs> we'll do that privately. I guess I, just, just to, to start this off with the first question, in your book, you, uh, and, and, and I've, I've I've thought, given some thoughts in writing to this also, you draw on, uh, on the theories of Arthur Schlesinger Sr. and Jr. about cycles of history and the, you know, which there is a, as many, as many different numbers for what the cycle would be <laughs> as there are historians who've taken that approach. But I wonder if you, um, how you reconcile that idea of a cycle of history in which, in a sense, maybe a 30-year conservative cycle has, has, has come to an end. Uh, how do you reconcile that theory with the idea of a sort of steady move towards progress? And I guess a kind of related question to that would be, I mean, you just talked about some of the great programs of the, of the, of the liberalism of the 60s, some of which are, are seen as a, sort of a little bit of an overreach that led to the backlash. How do, you, how do you do those things without creating situations that then in turn lead to the backlash? And that's my only question, then we'll, then we'll open it up. Uh, well, I think it's a great question, and, and uh, th there's a little bit of a, of a, of a two-part thing in there, so I'm, I'm going to sort of separate out the ideas. Uh, first of all, on the cycles of history thing, and I do, I reference the Schlesinger's work because I think it's brilliant, and I, I, I quote especially uh, Arthur Jr. extensively in the book, but the, uh, the interesting thing about it was that uh, he was uh, convinced enough about this, this cycle theory that uh, he wrote his book uh, in the mid-80s and uh, about the cycles of history. Um, and he predicted very strongly, he said, there's going to be another big wave of progressive reform in the 1990s. That's a 30-year cycle, and that's absolutely going to be in the 1990s. And then Bill Clinton got elected in 92, and it seemed like his prediction 
was coming true, and I, I, I remember, because I read the book when it first came out, and I was thinking, all right, you know, we're, we're another cycle, you know, and I'm here right in the middle of it, and this is going to be great, and, and uh, it didn't happen. And um, so there is nothing inevitable, I think, about the cycles of history. I think it is very much what we do with the time that we have and the moment that we have it. And I think the reason that it didn't happen, uh, I, I think there were multiple reasons, but the, the biggest single one was that the progressive movement at the time was so fragmented into single, single issue groups that there was, no, uh, there was no strong kind of overarching themes around progressive organizing. There was no vitality to the movement. I was the person in the White House who was working with the progressive community to try to get them engaged. And there was no sense of strong organizing out in the field or a great communication strategy. Um, we, we would get swamped on a regular basis by the Christian Coalition and the NRA and all of the right-wing groups, whether it was on health care or, or the budget or anything else. Uh, but uh, we, were, we were rarely swamped. In fact, I don't remember a time by the progressive movement coming in saying you have to, have to do this, you have to deliver this. So it's one of the reasons I'm hopeful now is because I think the progressive movement is stronger and more unified and that online activism is going to allow new forms of organizing to, uh, to come in. So, um, so that would be, I guess, my, my comment. In terms of the steady move toward progress, I, I actually don't see that. And, and I kind of think, uh, I thought that way too uh, at different points in, in my life, but the more I kind of read history and studied what happened is that what, what I found is that uh, instead there were waves of great progress uh, and that we didn't go back on those waves. I mean, once we abolished slavery, uh, it, it, it never came back. Once women got the right to vote, they had it forever. Once Social Security got in place, uh, it was there in spite of conservatives' efforts to take it away. But that uh, on so many sort of of the fundamentals of economic policy and, and social policy, voting rights policy, that rights got expanded, then contracted. Uh, ideas went forward and then they moved backwards. And so it was less a sort of steady progress and more uh, a wave uh, of good things happening and then uh, a conservative era. In terms of how, how we keep this going, I, th I do think that the experience of history is, is very instructive of that, particularly the contrast between what happened in the 1930s, what happened in the 1960s. FDR uh, uh, brilliantly figured out how to make something that was a sustained coalition over time. And, and he did it by focusing on programs that benefited uh, just about everybody. Uh, the Social Security really helped everybody. Uh, and, and, it, and it helped young people because their parents and grandparents were being taken care of uh, financially. It, it was something that appealed to everybody. The minimum wage, even though not everybody was on it, everybody's wages tended to be lifted uh, by it. Uh, and so uh, I think that was very, very important. Uh, the other thing that FDR was great at was uniting people uh, uh, around common goals, bringing people together uh, and, and getting them excited. LBJ, on the other hand, had all these great notions, some of which have lasted, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, you know, legal services, uh, Head Start, all of these things are still here. But the, the problem was that LBJ uh, sort of went, went down some paths that were more uh, more divisive, like with the war, and broke apart the progressive coalition. Uh, and, and that kept us from moving forward and, and sort of helped embolden the conservatives to come back on the backlash thing. I think it's more, it's more complicated about that. I could probably write another book just on that question, but, uh, uh, but I think those are some of, the, some of the elements to it. Great. We'll turn you into a full-time uh, book writer. Um, I'm going to uh, call on people for questions. Wait until Ben brings the microphone to you, and Ben to the person. Turn to the person to your well, that one, and then the one behind you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Carolyn Poplin. I'm from the Center for American Progress, and my question is about your use of the word progressive. Mm -hmm. um, there was a time um, when we we called ourselves liberals, um, and I wondered if the reason that you don't. I mean, I think Roosevelt called himself a liberal. Johnson certainly did, and so did Humphrey. Um, is it because the Republicans have so poisoned the word that uh, it, it, you think it has a negative implication? Or is it because you're, you think you're more of a centrist? That's certainly what Bill Clinton thought. Um, he, or at least that's what we thought he thought. Mm -hmm. um, there was all that stuff about triangulation after, mm -hmm. after Congress went Republican. 
Um, so is it one or the other or something completely different? Uh, well, it's, it's actually uh, pretty different. There are two reasons, uh, and I'm glad you asked the question because uh, um, my, my, uh, my wonderful friend Norman Lear uh, is generously hosting an event for me in Los Angeles uh, in a couple of weeks, and Norman gives me trouble all the time about calling myself a progressive versus a liberal, so I know he's going to ask this question at the, at the event, so I'm ready for it. Uh, the, uh, there, there are a couple reasons, though, and I, I, I did think very carefully about the use of the word progressive. One of the reasons, frankly, is, is being from the Midwest, uh, growing up in the Midwest, I, uh, the, the word liberal was actually never used. Uh, I mean, we, we, had, we had great progressives uh, in, in the med Midwest, uh, people like, you know, uh, George McGovern and, and in my home state, Nebraska, Frank Morrison, the governor there, was a wild man. I mean, he was great. Uh, Harold Hughes uh, in, in Iowa and, and, and John Culver and, and, and folks like that, they very rarely called themselves, if ever, uh, maybe, maybe McGovern did a little bit, but mostly they didn't call themselves uh, liberal. When I was growing up, uh, you, were, you were a uh, progressive populist or you were a right-wing populist or you were a, a corporate conservative. Uh, we were one of those three. Uh, and uh, the, nobody ever talked about uh, liberals uh, and uh, you know very uh, kind of instructive different regions talk about different things um, so I just never I grew up using the word progressive populist I mean I called myself a populist but I need to distinguish myself from the folks who were doing the pamphlets out in small towns saying that the Jews were were taking over and you know I mean there, there were those kinds of populists as well um, so you, you always wanted to make sure you said you were a progressive populist and not a not, not, uh, not a, you know, a right winger. Uh, but the other reason is actually a historical reason, and this is, this is a stronger reason, and that is liberal has meant very, very different things over the years. Uh, John Locke uh, called himself a liberal. Uh, there, there were times when, you know, some very conservative folks called themselves liberal. John Stuart Mill was not a conservative in some ways, but he wasn't. A, all of those folks in different eras at different times called themselves liberal. Well, but, but my, my book's about history, right? I mean, my book is about all these different eras and all these different folks. And progressivism, while, while all the people you mentioned who called themselves liberal did, they also called themselves progressives. And the progressive era itself was a certain kind of era uh, that, uh, that, that happened where that word was widely used. And, um, and even in, you know, earlier than that, the pr progressive was considered as moving forward and making progress. And, so it was more, uh, historically, it was a more consistent term uh, that, that, that seemed more comfortable to me. So. Thanks. That was a good, it was useful to, that you identified yourself. And please keep questions short and construct them in a way that a question mark could reasonably be put at the end of them. Yes. <laughs> Sarah Van Gelder with Yes Magazine. And my question is to bring us up to the very current, the economic um, dilemma that's going on in, in, here in DC, but of course around the world and picking up on your uh, populist theme, we have this really interesting division in the Obama administration between Biden and having Jared Bernstein heading up mm -hmm. the middle class task, task force, which sounds like it picks up a lot on the populist mm -hmm. progressive theme, but we have a lot of appointees also that come straight out of Wall Street and seem like they may be much more interested in making sure their friends are well taken care of. So I'm wondering where, where you see both the Obama, you know, what is Obama really mm -hmm. about, the Obama administration really about in terms of the, the, the economic vision, but also where is there an opportunity for ordinary people and for social movements to have an influence? Because it seems like if history has taught us anything, it's that the entrenched interests of co Wall Street and corporate interests can either give way or continue to set us back. I think, I think all uh, Democratic presidents in my, uh, in my adulthood, or in, in Jimmy Carter's case, I guess close to it, uh, I was almost an adult, uh, uh, high school and college, uh, have had that, that kind of inner argument, uh, it, that more of the kind of establishment, uh, to some extent Wall Street uh, kinds of folks versus more progressive populist, uh, as I was just describing it uh, a minute ago. Uh, Carter was was definitely ha had that conflict, and I and I argue in my book that Carter was the single most conservative Democrat, uh, Democratic president since Grover Cleveland, uh, that he ended up siding almost exclusively 
on economics, not on, not on foreign policy, not on other things where he was much better on, on the environment, on consumer issues he was much better on, but on economics that he cited overwhelmingly with, with the corporate side of that debate. Uh, Clinton, I think, was more, uh, was more in the middle. Uh, and so far, at least based on his appointments, I think two weeks it's a little early to, to make a definitive statement. But so far, I think Obama's more in the middle. He's got, he's got some appointees, as you said, who are more uh, establishment economic uh, folks. Uh, and I would argue more than, more than just uh, uh, Jared, uh, you know, I think Melody Barnes being announced as part of the economic team was very significant, a very strong uh, progressive person. I, I think. Uh, Hilda Solis will be confirmed, and uh, I think she'll be an incredibly strong part of that economic team. So uh, I think there are some very, very good progressive folks, uh, but there will be a kind of internal debate, an internal fight within the Obama administration as well as within Congress, and I think that's sort of the nature of, of uh, the modern Democratic Party. I think that the times are going to force Obama to go more progressive rather than less. I mean, my, I, I believe that the problems are too big to go with conventional wisdom, conventional economic, you know, uh, solutions that, the, that more of the corporate folks uh, propose. I think if it were more normal times, it'd be more of an even debate, but I think, I think we're going to do conventional wisdom things and then find it's not enough and have to go further and bigger and deeper and more progressive, and I think that's going to happen time and time again just because of the problems. And by the way, that was true with FDR and it was true with Lincoln. Uh, and, it was tr and it was true with Teddy Roosevelt. Each of them faced uh, those kinds of internal debates. Each of them was initially more cautious and then moved uh, left, uh, frankly, moved to the more progressive side because the, the times demanded it. Uh, and Teddy Roosevelt actually moved that way in part because he was ticked off by uh, the corporate guys who kept pushing back at him and he, Roosevelt had that personality. He's like, okay, you're gonna push against me you know, screw you! I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go push back. So uh, partly that was a Roosevelt, Roosevelt uh, personality. Uh, but that debate is, I think, is a constant among the folks who have become more progressive, and the times have demanded that they that they shift to the progressive side. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can phrase this um, coherently. Um, you may have addressed it a little bit in, in the answer you just gave. My, my question piggybacks a little bit on the last one. Um, you know, looking at the news and the way Congress is reacting, the headline in the Post today with the Democrats and the Republicans' um, reaction to the stimulus bill, um, I think back to Roosevelt, and, uh, not Teddy, but Franklin. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when he came in, I mean, he came in. Um, uh, with his class thinking, oh, well, he'll be better than what will happen if we don't put him in. Mm -hmm. And then he came in, and uh, like Obama, there was some conservatives that he put in, in place mm -hmm. and some liberals and actually had them sort of fight it out. I think people tend to think that Congress was with him from the start, but my understanding is that it was not. And I was wondering if you could draw some parallels, slightly more detailed parallel between what happened with Roosevelt and what appears to be happening now and how Roosevelt dealt with it, instruction that might have for Obama? Well, Roosevelt uh, ran on, uh, on a pretty uh, vague platform in 1932 that was mostly about, I'm not Hoover. I mean, it, it really was, you know, uh, not hard for him to win election because the country was in such dire shape. And he actually talked about the importance of balancing the budget. I mean, it was a very sort of modest, you know, uh, uh, platform. It, there, it was not radical uh, at all. And then, as you said, he did appoint a variety of advisors. I think his theory of change was very similar to Obama's, which is that we need to get the establishment engaged uh, with us and part of our team because you can't change things in a big way without, without having the establishment uh, at least partly signed on. Um, and so, and in his early, uh, the, the early things that he did were uh, a little bit more cautious, a little bit more careful, and, and as you said, Congress was a little bit more cautious. But again, I mean, the times just kept forcing him to do bigger uh, and bigger things. It, it didn't allow him to, ba to take small steps, and I, I believe probably that we are in a, a similar kind of period that the times themselves require huge solutions and big changes. And 
if we keep doing sort of small, modest things, that uh, it, will, it, it will not work. And I think that's, that's what will move Congress. I think that's what, what will move Obama. The, the fascinating thing about the current debate is that the media um, is, pick, is picking up right where it left off. They, they love conventional uh, debates. And this, okay, so this debate is about wasteful spending, so they're getting all worked up about the wasteful spending. They're not thinking about the bigger implications. They're not thinking about the kind of massive shifts that are going on. Um, th those kinds of questions don't really interest them very much. Uh, they're, they're, they, they, like, they like this very formulaic, nice, okay, you know, Republicans are saying it's wasteful spending, so we're going to talk about that. Um, I think all of that we're, is going to, sh to be shifting over time. And I, it was funny, I, I was looking by, uh, at something that, that a very, very strong, strongly progressive uh, economist uh, wrote uh, right, right in, over, over the lunch hour. For some reason, I had this thing from December 4th uh, that I was reading, and it, and it was talking about uh, how, how important it was that the stimulus be, uh, you know, at least 150 billion and probably more. Uh, and, and this was from a, a lefty, right? <laughs> right? And, and I, I, I remember when Campaign for America's Future, you know, came out with a thing, uh, you know, I think three weeks later that said it has to be at least 450 billion, not a penny less. And, and so I think what we're seeing is that the solutions are going to have to get bigger. And, and week by week, that's going to happen. And I, th I think it's going to happen on a range of issues. I, I hope so, yeah. Yeah. Sue Mark Smock, do you think you could, well, probably not you, do you think someone else could write uh, a, another book on cycles that are conservative, not backlash? Mm -hmm. I, it might be quite instructive for those of us who are progressive and liberal. Um, and I wondered what you thought of that. Well, I did actually talk in my book quite a bit about how, how conservatives came back into power. Uh, and, and how they governed when they, uh, when they did. Uh, and it is interesting that there are a lot of parallels on the progressive side from, from era to era in, in terms of history. Uh, there, there are some parallels, quite dramatic parallels, especially in the rhetoric on the conservative side, but the reasons that it happened were, uh, were actually uh, quite different in different uh, periods. Uh, and that was one thing that was striking uh, and partly it was the it was the nature of the of the politicians on our side and on their side. Partly it was sort of the nature of the times. But FDR, for example, was able to build an enduring majority that lasted a couple of generations. And if you look at Congress, arguably three generations. Uh, and uh, LBJ wasn't, and Lincoln wasn't, uh, and uh, so and there were different reasons for that. Lincoln might have if he if he'd lived. Uh, and we, we don't know, obviously. Uh, but I in each era, there were sort of different things that, that happened. Uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and, and Woodrow Wilson uh, were not able to because World War I just kind of uh, blew, blew everything up in terms of the, the progress that was being made. And, and when women, women finally got the right to vote, and that was sort of the last gasp, and then it turned very conservative because people were tired of, of all these big changes in the war and all of those things. Uh, and so each era was, was a little bit different. The, the one thing that was amazing in terms of the parallels was, was the sort of rhetoric and, and ideology of the conservatives. You look at the social Darwinists and what they advocated versus what Reagan advocated 100 years later, identical. You look at what Coolidge and Harding uh, and Hoover advocated in the 1920s, Compare it to what Reagan, Bush advocated, identical. I mean, word for word identical uh, in terms of the policies they advocated. I'm Steve Schafferman with IncomeSecurityForAll.org. Uh, one of the themes that uh, I'm wondering if you touch on in the book. I've only glanced at it briefly. Uh, you mentioned the uh, progressive movements in the 1880s, the 1930s, the 1960s, and something that repeatedly occurred in those eras was a push for some sort of guaranteed income. Mm -hmm. And the 
1890s, we had uh, Henry George and Edward Bellamy, and they helped spark the progressive and populist movements. In the 1930s, we had uh, Huey Long and Francis Townsend. In the 1960s, Milton Friedman, John Kenneth Galbraith, Martin Luther King. Um, so I'm wondering if you discuss that idea and how it relates to your theme, and if you see any hope for restoring the debate about uh, true guaranteed income, because that's what IncomeSecurityForAll.org is working on. I, I, I talk about it to some extent, uh, it, in the, but more in the sort of overall thematic sense of uh, investing in, uh, in incomes and, uh, and the ability for working class people and poor people to enter the middle class uh, in the, and that sense of, of an expanding middle class as opposed to a shrinking middle class, a, an economy based on broad prosperity rather than bubbles. Uh, because if you look at conservative eras, prosperity was based on bubbles. And if you look at more progressive eras, it was based on broad uh, economic security and, and uh, rising incomes for uh, the middle class, working class, and for poor people. Uh, and so I, I talk uh, in the book about uh, all of those things and, and about the successes that the progressive movement has had. In fact, one of the things I argue in the book is uh, one of the one of the great ironies of, of modern political debate is this is this uh, rather bogus interpretation that conservatives have pushed that the war on poverty was an abject failure. In fact, the war on poverty cut cut poverty dramatically in just six years. Uh, uh, I mean, it was it was remarkable. It started Head Start, started legal services, started community action agencies. The war on poverty was actually an incredible success, uh, and. Um, but the modern conservative movement has convinced Americans that, that it wasn't. And a lot of it had to do with those kinds of income issues. Um, Daniel Lippman, I'm a student at GW. Um, how would you say the uh, economic crisis and the federal government's budget problems, um, how, do, how do they impact uh, the progressive change that um, Obama is advocating, does it slow it down or because a lot of these things cost money or should we just expect a trillion dollar deficit every year for the next four or five years? I think that crisis uh, tends to uh, create uh, big change moments a, a lot of the time because the solutions to big problems are, uh, tend to be big themselves. You, you, have, to, you have to think bigger. Uh, in order to get things done. I think that over the short term, we are going to have huge deficits, and that would be true whether, uh, obviously, whether you had a conservative uh, like Bush or McCain, since they advocated for huge deficits as well, uh, or whether you have a, have a more progressive uh, economic policy. Uh, but I think how you then go about uh, working on uh, bringing the, the budget back more into, into closer balance I don't think it has to be an exact balance. I, I, I think if you make investments that pay off over time, that 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 that's fine. But but to bring it down out of the out of the, the really outrageous uh, deficits that we've got now and and will have for a while, um, th I think there are all kinds of things that you can look at in terms of how you do that. And I think progressives ought to engage that debate. Um, there's there's a guy I believe his name is David K. Johnston. Uh, who's done some outstanding writing on all of the different tax loopholes. I mean, amazing amounts of uh, tax loopholes, the dollars uh, that go out in tax loopholes at the, at the federal, state, and local level, uh, that, that if we just repealed those corporate loopholes, uh, that would solve the, uh, <laughs> the budget deficit all by themselves. So there are a lot of progressive-minded things that you can do uh, that will balance the budget. And it, it's a matter of whether you whether you think in terms of the, what the conservatives think, what, what Bush uh, and, and McCain and Reagan before that thought, which is let's just, let's just cut taxes for rich people and every, everything will take care of itself, or whether you think more in terms of how do we build the economy by building from the bottom up and having a broad prosperity for, for everybody. So it's more about how you spend the money than, than uh, one solution or another in terms of the deficit. Hi, I'm uh, Justine Adelizzi with Rock the Vote. Um, how much do you factor in the rising engagement of the millennial generation in um, 
you know, your point about the sustainability of the big moment of change. Because, I mean, we have seen that, um, you know, political party identification has had a huge swing mm -hmm. just even since 2000. You know, more young people are willing to identify themselves as liberals. And, you know, the split between Obama and McCain was 66-32 mm -hmm. this time around. So uh, do you think, I mean, I'm very interested in the generational aspect mm -hmm. of it as mm -hmm. well. So how much of a factor do you think, do you think that's going to play? I think it's going to play uh, a huge impact. Uh, the fact that young people have moved so strongly in a progressive direction and a democratic di direction in recent years has been part of an overall uh, change in, uh, in American politics. I, I talk in the book, when I, when I get to the modern era in the, last, in the last couple of chapters, I talk in the book about how uh, uh, right around uh, 2005, although with young people it started before that, they were sort of the, the leader on this. Uh, but there was kind of a tectonic plate shift in American politics that, that the combination of Bush's uh, ill-fated Social Security privatization campaign combine, combined with Katrina, combined with the Terry Schiavo uh, craziness, uh, combined with all of the poorly managed Iraq war uh, kind of stuff that was going on. It all kind of came together in a moment for the American people, and it moved young people even more dramatically than it moved everybody else, and young people were kind of the leader on it. They, they almost saw it coming before uh, other age groups did. And uh, so you saw, you, you just saw big movements of folks toward progressive policies and, and uh, toward the Democratic Party. Uh, and it really was a, a moment in time where 2004 was about evenly divided. It had been about evenly divided for, for several years uh, uh, in American politics. And just all of a sudden, everything shifted. Uh, I guess I should go like this because it was to the left. But uh, er everything shifted. And uh, it was an amazing moment. And young people are at the center of that. And, and young people were absolutely at the center of uh, Obama's victory. Uh, I mean, the, the, the numbers that they went for him by and the fact that they turned out in higher numbers were some of the, some of the huge stories of this election. And I, think, I do think that's a generational thing, that that generation is going to c uh, carry us into a new progressive era that I, I hope will last for a while. Why did the, um, Gerard Wilmore, why did the progressive movement not come out to reinterpret or interpret uh, Jeremiah Wright at the time uh, that uh, he made that sermon, God Damn America. That mm -hmm. was just a flash, a rhetorical flash. Mm -hmm. The man had a lot of other things to say over the period of years that he preached at uh, that church in Chicago. And uh, <clears throat> Dwight Hopkins and James Cone, a lot of black American theologians uh, supported a uh, right in his uh, as a member of a movement called Black Liberation Theology in this country. Mm -hmm. I'm just interested why uh, the liberal movement, the progressive movement, did not see that as an opportunity to prevent uh, uh, Obama from moving to the right as he did in that occasion. On that occasion, I think some of them did. I think if you if you read the for example, the, the progressive blogs at the time, they actually made a lot of, uh, a lot of those observations uh, about Wright and, and did defend him. But I think, uh, I think what happens at given moments uh, is that election politics overwhelm everything else and that people felt a need to rally around Obama and, and defend Obama from the attacks as opposed to uh, defending this guy who was, who in their, you know, in most people's view, was making trouble for Obama. Uh, and so I think it was kind of an instinctive rallying of the troops. And, uh, and, it, and this, this happens over and over again in history, is elections sometimes distort uh, what, what in, an, in a normal period, in a normal year, uh, might be a really, you know, interesting back and forth, a good, a good healthy debate uh, about something. Uh, elections sort of uh, uh, get people very focused on winning the election and, uh, and, and you know, frankly, I think need to be. Uh, I mean, I'm certainly for winning elections. I think it's really a useful thing. So, uh, um, so I, I, think that's, I think that's what went on then. I think if that had happened this year uh, or, or, or two years prior, it would have been a different dynamic. 
Uh, but I think in the heat of the moment, people rallied around Obama uh, and wanted to shut off the debate for that reason. Thanks. I'm Diane Perlman. Thank you very much for your interesting analysis. Um, one area that seems to be lagging behind and lagging in <coughs> imagination is foreign policy dealing with conflict, nuclear proliferation, terrorism, and war. And it seems like the big leap is carrots in addition to sticks or dialogue, yeah. diplomacy, and negotiation. And there are, are much, there's much more knowledge, information, um, and conflict analysis of more effective ways of dealing with these issues. And one is I don't see, I, I see Obama using a lot of the old strategies, although adding talking, mm -hmm. which in a way could be doomed to fail if other things aren't taken into account. That there's still a, a lot of the old way of thinking. And you know, part of the problem is I think that the people who possess um, the bodies of knowledge and conflict analysis are in academia and their work isn't well known in, mm -hmm. um, in the public sphere, but it's knowable. A lot of unintended consequences are completely predictable and preventable. And you know, the policies that he seems to be leaning towards now are a little better, but they could be much, much, much better and much more informed by social science and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I think it's a really important question, and I don't know, I don't know the answer. I think there's so much that we have yet to figure out with Obama in, in terms of where he is on, on those kinds of issues, uh, and and my guess is that that. Uh, being relatively new to foreign policy, uh, he's going to play it, uh, play it a lot by ear uh, before we kind of see a defining philosophy uh, that develops. Uh, I think that he's got an interesting mix of people around him advising him on foreign policy. Uh, you know, he's got, he's got, you know, Hillary Clinton and he's got the woman who called Hillary Clinton a monster. Uh, he, he's got, uh, people like Susan Rice and people like Jim Jones. I mean, it, it's a very interesting and very eclectic group of advisors, and I think it will be fascinating to see how that, how that evolves. I was, uh, I was thrilled. Uh, when you look at the first few days of the presidency, the fact that he called a boss, uh, you know, immediately, the first guy called, the fact the first interview he did with a foreign uh, media source was, uh, was an Arab uh, TV station. Uh, I, I mean, the, some of the thing, you know, appointing an Arab American, George Mitchell, uh, not not known that he's an Arab American because of the name, but uh, you know, uh, uh, George is half Arab, Arab American. Um, as as uh, the envoy to the Middle East, I I ran into uh, Jim Zogby from America, Arab American Institute uh, about three days after the inaugural, and he said he's already done more. For Middle East peace, you know, in in a couple of days, as you know, George Bush did in eight years, and and uh, uh, so s just some of those kinds of symbolic things, I I was very impressed by, and uh, you know, I, I hope to see more of that, but I think it's going to take a while for uh, uh, for Obama c to kind of uh, get his sea legs and develop uh, his foreign policy philosophy. Hi. Ann Anderson, I guess my closest connection to social action is psychologist for social responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and I, <coughs> I seem to be developing a cold, so I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm cur right now I'm feeling like, well, we should be thanking, as progressives, we should be thanking the conservatives for creating the climate of, you know, of uh, mm -hmm. situation that then we can move the change forward. My, my bet is that that isn't exactly what your book says. I'm looking forward to reading it. But what it really raised for me is, you know, how would you like us to use your book? I mean, what it, why did you write it? What is it that is there that we can take forward in our activism? Well, I wrote the book because I wanted to talk about the narrative that, that I believe American history is, where uh, progressives push for positive change that makes the country better and conservatives fight that change and to talk about how successful we as progressives have been uh, it, it, when our ideas have, have been in power and when we've been in power 
and, and how, how much it has improved the country and made the country uh, a better place and a place that, that we can be proud of to live in. Uh, and so I wanted to sort of build that broad historical narrative and kind of talk about it in those terms uh, so that people could relate to, uh, to it in those terms. Uh, but I also believe, especially now with the moment that we are in, because I wrote the book in the spring of last year before the big financial crisis hit, before I even knew for sure that Obama would be elected, although I, I was sure hoping <laughs> that would be the case. But we're, we're in this moment now where we've got, we really do have uh, a crisis that, that will force us, I believe, to have another big change moment. And uh, that could all go awry. Uh, you know, it, it, we could get bogged down and, and end up being unsuccessful in that. But uh, I think we are so positioned right now in this moment in history and so the, the message that I've been taking now in the, you know, in the interviews I've been doing and in the talks I've been giving is uh, now is the time uh, for another big change moment. We need, to, uh, we need to not be cautious. We need to not go slow. We need to not be, you know, uh, mince around with little, little changes here and there. We need to think big and, and we need to act boldly and, and uh, really move the dial. Uh, and, and that's what will get America out of this crisis. So that's the message of my book. Hey, Mike. Hey. Um, I'm Lowell Feld. I'm a progressive blogger and Netroots activist. I'm wondering um, uh, how much impact you think the rise of the Internet as a technology has had on the progressive movement. And then how effective has the progressive blogosphere been, do you think, um, in promoting our candidates, our values, and in combating the right-wing noise machine. Um, to the extent that it hasn't been effective, I'm also curious to know what you think needs to be changed. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I, I actually talk a lot in the book about the importance of online organizing and, and, and blogs being the biggest part of that, but also, of course, uh, organizations like Move On. Uh, that uh, online organizing has become an absolutely invaluable tool for the progressive movement, not just because uh, of the organizing side of it or the fundraising side of it or the communication side of it. Uh, uh, I mean, all of those things uh, are amazing. And the fact you can do them all at once uh, is amazing. But also, I think that having an online progressive community in the blogosphere and in Move On and, and in other organizations has created a sense of a movement as opposed to a bunch of single issue groups. And that's, uh, you know, what we were really uh, had problems with in the 90s and in the 80s is we had all these different issue groups doing their thing, but there was no broad progressive vision. There was no broad progressive movement. People did not rally to each other's side. Uh, the, and that's what you need in a movement. And uh, uh, the, the, the internet has actually created a forum for that. And the blogosphere has created a forum for that, that people think in broader progressive terms now, I think because of uh, the, the blogosphere, uh, and, and I, I, I just think it's been a fundamental kind of sea change uh, in, in uh, the progressive movement and in American politics. Um, in terms of the effectiveness, I, th I, th I think that there have been moments of incredible effectiveness and that it has opened up opportunities uh, that, that we never had before. You, we're no longer dependent upon the establishment uh, to decide which is going to be the big money race, you know, because move on in the blogosphere and other folks can decide themselves which, which races are going to be the big money race. And so that's changed things. There, there's been a lot of wonderful opportunities, but I, I, I think we have yet to see uh, sort of the, the peak of that. I, I think that uh, people get very excited about certain races, but there's not, there hasn't yet been kind of a bigger strategic vision about how to build that and how to use that. Uh, and I think that's what all of us who are involved in online activism ought to be uh, thinking about. Uh, Matthew Sabellis reading is fundamental. We, um, I noticed uh, in your, uh, pardon me, your flyer that you were talking about the uh, great, uh, how the um, war on poverty had had such great effect. And part of my organization is we were pretty much begun in 1966. And we were coming into May, April and May, we're going to be doing a lot of trying to outreach and communicate with thought leaders on Capitol Hill about why we need to be sustained, why we need to be able to grow even in this crisis economy. And I'm wondering to what extent maybe you can address here or perhaps your book addresses forward action. 
how do organizations that have been effective and continue to be effective at a local grassroots level like ours or other organizations, how can they either partner together or how can they communicate on Capitol Hill to the, well, to the decision makers who are going to sustain budgets or crush budgets? Uh, how can we communicate to them in an effective way to sustain the work we do and also uh, continue to achieve goals or achieve even bigger goals? There's so much talk about spending more at the government level. How can we actually tap into that and excite people on Capitol Hill? Mm -hmm. uh, the book really doesn't address, it, it's, not, it's not as much of a how-to book in terms of uh, how individual groups can do that. It, it, it more, as I said, it works to create more of a sweeping historical narrative about these issues. Um, it, but in my consultant hat, <laughs> I can tell you that uh, uh, organizations are only going to uh, gain traction on Capitol Hill right now by, by working together and also by thinking big and thinking about how your issue fit into the broad framework of trying to rebuild the economy. Uh, and and I, when I was on the, uh, the transition team for uh, Obama-Biden, I, I spent a lot of time telling groups, look, uh, you need to figure out how what you're doing fits into the big priorities right now because the priorities uh, that are out there, rebuilding the economy uh, being number one, are so huge that they're sort of going to sort of swallow everything else up. The people aren't going to be thinking about uh, small programs or small ideas because they got this big stuff that's sitting right in the middle uh, of the room that they got to deal with. Uh, and so. Uh, figuring out how to build what you're doing and, and make it part of that bigger debate uh, and, and to do it in coalition with other organizations, I think, is, is really the way to go. Hey, Mike. Steve Cobble. Um, I assume if a Democratic candidate had come to you a year and a half ago, one of your pieces of recommendation would be just tie Bush around their neck like a big millstone. I'm wondering if you could say a couple words about tying Bush as a millstone around the neck of the failures of conservative ideology as a way to gain space for us in the coming decades, the way we did with Hoover, the way they did with the Confederates uh, in the past. Uh, I, I'm a total believer in that. And in fact, one, one, of, the, one of the groups that I'm on the board of uh, and helped found, Americans United for Change, uh, we've been running ads uh, that talk about, okay, do, do you want to be with Obama or do you want to be with Bush on, on the economy? Uh, and uh, we're not, we're not going to let him just sort of fade into the sunset. Uh, uh, in fact, we sponsored a Bush legacy tour uh, la last year <laughs> with a bus that went all over the country with exhibits as to what Bush had done for health care and what Bush had done for the economy and, you know, all those kinds of things. And, I, and you know, and I, you know, I, uh, talked about uh, how I was at a uh, high school student when Jimmy Carter took office. Uh, and for, th for the next 20 years, I kept hearing every election, I kept hearing uh, the Democrats are just like Jimmy Carter. Uh, I mean, they, they, they never gave that up. And in fact, this year, I was sort of stunned because I, I figured so many people, you know, had died off who had, were around then. But, <laughs> Uh, but McCain, at one point, uh, compared Obama's policies to Jimmy Carter's. Uh, so, you know, if they can do that uh, for a guy who served only four years and only did, you know, a little bit of damage, think about what we can do uh, for a guy who served eight years and, and did an incredible amount of damage. And I, I do think that should be part of what we do. I think we need to, uh, you know, look back in history and be very specific about the failures. And the fact is that conservative policies have never succeeded. They have never succeeded. The, 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 the reason that the right wing has been so excited about Reagan is that uh, he's the only one where the failures were not really, really obvious right when he was president. Uh, although, you know, the deficits and all, you know, the savings and loan crisis and all those things were big failures. But, but, but he didn't leave office with it absolutely hung around his neck the way Hoover did, the way Bush did. Uh, the way Nixon did. Uh, so, um, but the conservatives have never succeeded, never, uh, in, in American history. Their policies have never worked. And I think we just need to keep repeating that theme and tying it to specific people like Bush uh, as, long, as long as it works. Thanks. Chester. Thank you. <coughs> Chester Hartman from PRAC, the Poverty and Race Research Action Council. What's your take on race? 
the tension between Obama being a, you know, a president who happens to be black and a black president, uh, you know, in the sense of how much can he push racial issues without being kind of pushed aside. Uh, I thought, for example, the Washington Post piece about Eric Holder yesterday was incredibly optimistic, wrongly optimistic about how somehow having a black attorney general can really get at the racism in the United States. Is he going to be able to do anything seriously about the, the structural, institutional racism that exists? Well, I think, I think it's a fascinating question. And I think, I think there will be things that he will be able to do uh, that, that, are, uh, that are really important. And I think uh, th there, there are just certain uh, moments when it, gets, when it gets easier, when some of those issues get easier. And him being elected president, I think, is going to be helpful. But I think what we've got to avoid uh, is that sense that, OK, uh, a black guy's president, so there is no more racism. Uh, and uh, there, you, you had a little bit of a feel of that in that Holder article you were, you were talking about. Uh, we need to uh, really push back against that uh, because uh, race is the most single most fundamental dynamic in the history of American political debate. And I, I, I quote, you know, era after era, issue after issue, uh, that race has come up again and again and again, sometimes uh, subtly most times really blatantly and uh, so and that's not going to go away in, in fact i i personally am convinced that if the economy uh, uh, fails that if that if obama is not a success at sort of re rebuilding the economy that there will be a, a racial backlash uh, uh, as a result of that i fear that uh, i think i think it is so important for this president to succeed uh, for so many reasons but that to me is one of them uh, that I can totally see that kind of uh, backlash happening uh, of, 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 you know, if the economy is, uh, sinks and, and, you know, a lot of people are like, well, you know, that, that black guy, you know, uh, he's, he's, he didn't fix anything, you know. Uh, so I, I really think we're, we're at a dangerous uh, moment just as we're at an incredibly exciting uh, moment and I think we, we absolutely have to push back on that and we have to push back as well. I mean, this whole idea that Martin Luther King was a social worker, you know, which is which you, is what you sometimes get from all of the all of the the modern day uh, rhetoric about King. I mean, we have to push that. Uh, you know, Barack Obama, Martin Luther King are part of a are part of a broad progressive tradition that's going to solve problems for everybody, uh, and that their race is important to that, but it's not. Uh, the only thing that defines them, and I think we've got to keep pushing for for justice on on all levels. Think about two more questions, right, uh, right there in the blue shirt. Thanks. Um, I was actually wondering. You talked about sort of the convergence. Can you of say who you are? Oh, sorry. My name is Chris Neary. Um, you've talked about the convergence of uh, a lot of the liberal interest groups on the internet. They've been able to come together and support each other. But I'm wondering if that's sort of a double-edged sword, and if Obama does not deliver a lot of big change, especially for some of those interest groups, whether they'll be able to sort of, you know, make Obama accountable. Um, and I'm wondering if there's sort of a, a tipping point, um, or if there's, uh, and I think you've talked about this on Open Left already. There have been uh, a lot of people have been disappointed with some of his cabinet picks, and they sort of, you know, uh, got, you know, pretty heated um, with him. Pretty early on, I'm wondering if there's a if do, whether you think his coalition will be resilient, and you know at what point will we know uh, whether they'll turn against him. I think I think the coalition will be resilient uh, if he's successful. Um, uh, and I, I really I, I I look on some things on a very basic level, right? I'm, I'm a pretty simplistic guy in some ways. Um, I think that if Obama succeeds, if he gets us out of the mess that we are in, uh, if the economy starts to improve again, if he succeeds at reshaping health care, if he succeeds at doing something about climate change, if he gets big things done uh, and is a successful president, that the coalition will hold and strengthen and that people will come away, you know, maybe grousing about this or that, but basically happy. Um, I think that uh, if he's not getting a lot of those things done, then I think you will see a rising tide uh, of unhappiness. 
And the thing about uh, the Internet that is different than, than when I was in the Clinton White House or, you know, in, in years past is that you will see that rising tide uh, <laughs> develop right in front of you. You know, you, 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 won't, you won't have to guess about the, the disaffection because you will see the level of, of anger and, and dismay start to rise. And so uh, I think Obama needs to, needs to succeed at some of these big things and he needs to show progress early. And if he does, I think that will carry him through some of the minor, more minor, uh, I hope, disagreements. Uh, Jesse Hack is World Reach Communications. Uh, I want to pull a couple of threads together, and, and some of which have been coming from you. You um, uh, reference a, a few minutes ago the rhetoric and ideology of conservatives. Okay, and you gave an example of your bus tour. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in in what I see as the damage and danger that can be caused by this. Uh, do you have any sense of whether this is a large enough area to have huge impact, broad impact, or do you think it is too small to spend much time on? Uh, when you say this, I'm not sure. The rhetoric, the, 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 the danger in the extreme rhetoric of, of many conservatives? I think that it is uh, absolutely useful to expose it, especially on some issues. Uh, I think on, on uh, I think it really depends on what it is. I think that, uh, for example, uh, when on immigration issues, which is, which is an area that I've spent uh, some time on as a consultant, uh, help, helping uh, immigrant rights organizations, and we found that when people actually hear the, the rhetoric of the right wing on, uh, on, on immigrant issues because it is so outrageous, that uh, they're shocked, that that's not how they feel. They, they might be uncomfortable about, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, some, some issues around immigration. They might have a knee-jerk reaction to certain things, but they don't share the, that kind of uh, intense animosity toward uh, mostly toward Hispanic people that, that are exhibited in that kind of rhetoric. So I think it's very useful on an issue like that. I think there are, I think there are other issues where uh, people just don't, uh, don't relate to uh, the extreme rhetoric or think that it's like from another era or from another, uh, you know, uh, from such an extreme group that they don't, they don't think about it or don't worry about it. Uh, and in fact, one of the things I did in the book was I quoted some modern uh, you know, conservatives and their rhetoric about certain things and compared it to quotes from the past where it was identical in terms of the, the level of nastiness and extremism. Uh, and I think, so I think that's important to do in, uh, in many areas. Uh, I think sometimes, I mean, I, and I, I find this in polling, is that we will, we will mention a quote or even sometimes a piece of uh, legislation that conservative Republicans have pushed uh, and people won't actually believe it the, 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 in focus groups. They'll, they'll just say, oh, that, they, they wouldn't have done that. Uh, you know, that, I mean, a bill that was actually introduced by somebody and we'll tell them, this is the bill, this is the bill number, this is what it is. They wouldn't have done something that extreme. That's crazy. We, we, we don't, we, they, didn't, they didn't believe us, uh, even though it was true. Um, so uh, you, you have to kind of balance that when you're, when you're thinking about what to use and what not to use. Any last qu last question uh, before Ben? No. <laughs> Make you do one last performance, and then get you all out to happy hour or whatever it is people <laughs> do on Friday nights. And this you want to send us off on a, a, a good note, and I appreciate that. I'm Carl Lankowski, uh, but uh, I wanted to ask you kind of the reverse question that's been asked for most of the afternoon. Uh, what would have to happen? What, what would happen for this that would lead this enterprise, assuming you mean the next cycle of, of progressivism, to fail? You know, uh, I, well, I, I, can, I can speak to this from personal experience because uh, it, failed, it failed in, uh, in the Clinton era. Not, not that Bill Clinton didn't get some good things done, not that there weren't a lot of things that were achieved, but 
what was achieved was small. It was not a big change moment. And I think what we need now is a big change moment because the problems are so big. And I think, I think it's, it's being cautious. It's being scared of, of doing too much uh, or, or going too far. Uh, and Obama himself has said, uh, I think we, we're more likely to err on, on going too small than going too big. Uh, he's used that kind of rhetoric, and I think he's absolutely right. Uh, but if Obama, through the, through the daily uh, you know, uh, debate on Capitol Hill and through the media, kind of trashing him over this and that and the other, if Obama starts to pull back and get careful and cautious, and if the Congress starts to pull back and get careful and cautious, then I think we fail. Uh, because we just have, uh, the, our problems are too big and we, we've got to have bold solutions. Terrific. Do you want to have any last words to close out this? No, I just, I just appreciate your interest so much and all the great questions and uh, I, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I hope, hope you enjoy the book. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>